Great. Um, yeah, so we have a great number of participants. So we're excited to have you all here for our second uh, Agroinformatics Tech Talk. So thank you for joining. These are a series of um, virtual, but also hopefully soon physical events where we're just inviting um, colleagues, experts from, from academia, from other from private sector, other, other agencies to, to share their research and their work with us. And the idea is to really create discussion, um, questions, share our work as well, and create a community and really strengthen, I think, the, um, the communication with everyone who's working in the agroinformatics field and anyone who's just working in tech and agriculture and today we're happy to have with us Dr. Alec DeWitt, senior scientist from the Wageningen University in Research. Um, and Zhang Jing Chen will open the session and say a few words about, I think, agroinformatics and the tech talks in general and what we're trying to, to build. Over to you, Zhang Jing. Uh, thank you, Luna. Uh, dear colleagues, good, good afternoon. As Luna said, uh, the Agroinformatics tech, tech Talk is a forum for sites that we invite experts from all around the world, in, uh, including inside the field, to share their expertise and experiences use information technology in agro-food uh, system digital transformation for better production, better nutrition, and better, better environment and better life. Uh, today, we are honored to have Dr. Alad DeWitt to give us a speech on open source tool and data for model applications in agriculture. Uh, Dr. DeWitt uh, is, with a, is a senior scientist with Wachen University and Research. For more than 20 years, he has been working in the domain of agrometeorological, uh, meteorology, remote sensing, and crop modeling for agricultural modeling and yield, uh, yield forecasting. He has coordinated many uh, projects and international projects, for example, developing of uh, crop modern system, including in uh, European Union, China, Russia, and Morocco, as well as capacity building in this area. With the framework of Dutch G4AW program, he adapted this technology for supporting smallholder farmers with uh, crop wiser advisories in Ethiopia, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. He's one of the uh, major developers of Wolfos the proper satellite model. You know, Wolfos is one of the early uh, crop growth model in the, in the world, and now is one of the major crop growth model uh, widely used uh, all around the world. And, and uh, uh, he, he's also the developed PSCE modeling framework, which is used by a lot of researchers around the world. So, Thank you again, uh, Dr. DeWitt. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zhongjin. Um, yeah, today I will start first sharing my screen. Okay, yes, thank you very much, Zhongjin, for uh, introducing me. Um, yeah, today I will yeah, give a small short talk about the uh, open source tools and data for model applications in agriculture um, and that really boils down to things that we've been developed here in Wageningen over the last five to 10 years, which I think are, well, useful for, for others as well. So um, I'm not very going very going very deep in many of these, uh, these tools or, or data, uh, but I just want to try to give you an overview and point you to the resources which are available to, to explore it yourself. Um, well, very short introduction on Wageningen University and Wageningen Research. Uh, this is an overview of the uh, Wageningen campus as we have in the Netherlands with uh, a couple of the uh, buildings of the various institutes here. And um, what many people often don't know is that Wageningen University and Research is actually two organizations in one. On the one side, we have Wageningen University, which about uh, 13,000 students, um, 2,000 300 PhD candidates and what is it, 3,700 staff. Um, and on the other side, we have Wageningen Research, uh, which is the research, uh, the contract research organization. So Wageningen University is more fundamental research education and Wageningen re uh, Research is more application oriented uh, research. And both organizations are well, similar in size and they, they work together uh, very closely, they're in the same buildings on the same campus. Um, and what you should understand is that these two organizations are largely symmetric. 
so for example, for Wageningen University, we have, an, for example, a department on agrotechnology and food scientists. While on Wageningen research, we have Wageningen food and bio-based research that applies to livestock, to environment, to plant, and also to social sciences. So <clears throat> often people wonder, no, who, who am, I, am I dealing with? Someone from the university or someone from research? Well, it depends. I actually am from Wageningen Research, from the, the Wageningen Environmental Research uh, Group here. Uh, but I actually do cooperate a lot with people from Wageningen Plant Research and also University on Plant Sciences. Okay, well, about open source tools and, and data products, um, I want to give you a, an introduction today on, on some modeling tools that we developed. First of all, this, uh, this PCA modeling framework, um, the models which are in there and some other resources which are helpful in if you want to start working with that uh, red framework. Um, and, and an example actually of what we used to build, which includes this framework um, where we built a, a somewhat broader framework for crop advisory generation, which was also applied operationally. And some of the, the open data sets, actually, that we have been developing over the last few years, um, the Ag Era 5 global meteorological data set, um, the global recently has been uh, put on the uh, Copernicus Climate Data Store, so-called global, global Crop Productivity Indicators, and finally something on the AgroStack initiative. Now, <clears throat> a little bit about uh, crop models developed in Wageningen. Um, these models have been mainly developed for what we call quantitative analysis of development, growth and production of annual field crops and by now also perennials. For example, there are models now for cocoa, for palm oil, for banana. Um, they simulate for different agroecological production levels. And what we um, mean with these production levels is that uh, our models usually target a so-called potential production level where we say that um, <clears throat> this is the production level that is reachable when everything else is perfect and in that such a production level it's only um, your your yield level is only determined by the amount of radiation that you have the temperature and the features of the crop itself if you go one level production level down you take into account water limit limitations if you go one limit level down, you also take into account nutrient limitations. And finally, you, uh, you reach basically the lowest production level where your yield is actually um, reduced by all kinds of factors like pest disease or uh, pollutants, um, which is typically what you find on, on the farmer field. <clears throat> but people often get confused about these models because they don't understand that, that concept of agroecological production levels. Now, the characteristics of these models further is that they're mechanistic, mechanistic, they're dynamic, um, and there are different approaches ranging really from relatively simple summary models to complex uh, models that take into account biochemistry and, and physics. And most of these models, they are public, so there are open source implementations available. Now, this is an, uh, always a nice picture that I, I like to show is because there is a really a, a pedigree of what they call the school of De Witt models. Well, and actually this De Witt, that's not me. It's, well, this, it's the same name. It's not even a relative, but this is Professor C.T. De Witt that you see in his picture there over there. And he started, uh, he wrote a very influential paper in 1965 called the photosynthesis of leaf canopies. And from that paper, actually a whole family of models actually developed um, and some of these models are still um, developed today such as little uh, gcross wofost and also Ira oriza the, the rice crop model from the uh, iri in the philippines is actually a, a branch of sucrose wofost well <clears throat> um this pcc modeling framework pcc stands for python crop simulation environment um, this is really what i would call a modern implementation for crop modeling python under an open source license so it's licensed under the european union public license um, it is both a modeling framework so you can use it to build models and it is a re-implementation of many wageningen models that have existed for many for many years already um, and it promotes good model design modularity, and it also provides easy ways to communicate between models. And what it also has, it has many tools available for reading 
all kinds of data. So it can read what we call legacy Cabo files, um, old weather files, but you can also connect, for example, to the NASA Power API for um, getting weather information. Um, now, it has also some uh, opportunities, possibilities for building testing of modules and models, and it integrates very well with the scientific software stack. So, for example, things like Pandas, machine learning, optimization algorithms, sensitivity analysis, um, you can implement that uh, quite seamlessly uh, through this um, modeling framework. Now, of course, there are also some limitations. Um, PCC focuses strongly on the agro domain. Um, so it's not a generic ODE solver, I would say. So it's not a, a generic solver which you can feed a couple of differential equations and it will basically solve these different differential equations through time. Um, it's also much slower than uh, similar uh, models in, in Fortran, for example, or C++ or FST. Um, and it is limited to what we call rectangular Euler integration with a fixed daily time step. It also doesn't have a graphical user interface um, because in many cases there is no really need for having a graphical user interface for, for modelers. Um, and often what I see is that there are third parties which are very good in developing graphical user interfaces which, which do that kind of work. Now, there's a list of models available that we have in PCZ. Um, we have the Woforst 7.2 potential production PP uh, model available, also the water limited production. Um, then we have Woforst 8, uh, but that's a beta release. I hope by the end of this year, we can actually release 8.1, um, which will have a much better uh, implementation of uh, nutrient limited growth. Now there is the so-called Lingra model, which stands for lintel grassland. And that is a model for the simulation of grass, grassland uh, productivity, which has some very um, well, detailed physiology of, uh, of growth of grasslands, which is quite uh, different from annual crops like uh, Wofost simulates. Um, <clears throat> another lintel model, which is lintel three, it's also there. And there is the implementation of the uh, FAO Water Requirement Satisfaction Index. Um, it's slightly different uh, because you can compute it in different ways, but it basically does the same thing. And finally, there's also a separate implementation of the phenological module only for Rovast. Now, we have quite a lot of documentation available now on uh, PCZ. Uh, if you go to this, uh, site pcc.readthedocs.io uh, that gives you the full um, documentation available for the framework and partially also the models. So there is the, the user guide, which basically tells you how to start, how to install it, and these kind of things. There's the reference guide, which gives you more insight in the different um, components which are inside the framework and how they work. And finally, there's the, the documentation of the code itself. Um, and you can really uh, jump around. Maybe I can even show you an example. For example, if you go here, again, for example, here's the reference guide where you have an overview of the different components. And for example, here's something about the Agro Manager and how you define Agro management in the model. And for example, if you go to the code documentation, then you can actually go to all the different. Uh, modules that are, that are available and you can easily actually connect to the code here which brings you directly to the code itself and also go back to the documentation over here let's get back to where i was another I think very useful resource are the so-called Jupyter Notebooks um, with examples that I created um, for many uh, different types of situations that you can in run into. These are also on my, uh, my GitHub page. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that there, if you scroll down a little bit down, then there is this button over here, which allows you to launch actually a, uh, a um, basically a Docker container where the system runs, which you can then interactively um, um, run, for example. If you go here, 
here are all the examples. For example, there are examples on getting started, running a model, running in batch mode, um, advanced agile management. Uh, there's advanced topics on data assimilation, parameter optimization, sensitivity analysis. Um, <clears throat> there's also an example here on the Lingra model with grassland productivity. But if you go here, here's the launcher button. You click on this one, then it will start uh, basically a, a virtual machine or a Docker container, which pulls in the repository and you are actually capable of interactively running those notebooks. Now this may take a little bit of a long time, so I'm not gonna wait for it, um, but you are able to play around with those notebooks interactively within, within your browser. Um, so that's, I think that's a very interesting um, way of, of being able to run um, the Python crop simulation environment. Um, now, models in the, 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 in the environment itself, they need a lot of parameters. Um, so one of the uh, things we make available is the model parameter library, which is also on my GitHub page, and that provides you the parameter sets for the Wolfos crop simulation model. There's another library for the Lingra model, um, and it gives some insight in how these parameter files are structured and how you can also add uh, your own, um, basically your own varieties or cultivars to the uh, parameter uh, file easily. And finally, we have, of course, some specific model documentation. Um, for example, if you go to the Wolfost uh, website on the uh, Wageningen University research site, you will find here under the documentation, you will find two links. One is called a gentle introduction to Wolfost. Uh, so if you're interested in, in understanding and running um, the model, then I suggest you start there because that really gives you a, uh, well, a, a gentle introduction and insight into the how the model works and, and how to interpret the output and, and all these kind of things. And there's the, also the Wofor 7.2 reference manual, which gives you information, detailed information on how the model works from a mathematical point of view. So if you want interested, but that's a pretty tough read. Okay, now, one thing we developed over the last few years with this uh, basis, a framework uh, is a, a, a framework for for crop advisory generation. So that was really targeted at providing farmers through the cropping season with um, advisory on how to handle, um, how to, to cultivate their crops. And it was developed first in Myanmar together with uh, a, uh, a seed provider, Laltier Seeds, and is the name of the company. And they provide um, basically tropical vegetables, um, so-called F1 hybrids, which need well, a, a, a different management than the farmers usually uh, did. They wanted to have a system for supporting their farmers. Um, and basically what we did was based on the idea that the day-to-day -day management of these crops is driven by, well, the crop phenological stage, Depend on, depending on which crop stage you are, you have to do different things. And it also depends on past, current and forecasted weather. So what we do, did was we developed quite a simple model in PCZ to simulate and predict um, crop phenological stages based on the BBCH scale for phenology. And then those advisories were developed by Laltier Seeds and also by the uh, Bangladesh Agriculture University. And they were connected to this BBCH scale uh, and also to certain weather events. Um, and then farmers were registered into the system based on their well, their location, rough location, so municipality, uh, their crop type and their sowing date. And based on that information, we had sufficient uh, data to run a model specifically for a particular farmer with a particular crop and a particular sowing date and provide them with the advisories um, that were relevant for that particular uh, location. And these were then broadcasted through uh, SMS. Well, for example, this is an example of the uh, simulated phenological development. Well, actually, this is made in Ethiopia for an, an area with quite stable um, conditions. So you see that the orange line, which is a development stage, is almost a straight line. Uh, and you start at the, the lower left with the BBC 0, which is sowing, and then it starts BBC 10, which is emergence, BBC 20, first leaf, 30, third leaf. I, I don't know from 
top of my head, up to BBC 99, which is uh, harvest or full maturity. Um, and in this case, like I said, it's it's a flat line. But for example, this is another example in Myanmar for sugarcane, where you see that those lines start to deviate based on different years. So depending on the climate conditions, you get difference in phonology and you get differences in the in when actually those messages are being sent. Um, now this is an example, for example, uh, BBC seed sowing was, I think is BBC 01, um, and that was connected to TSM0, but for example, seedling emergence, uh, BBC 10 is, is at TSM 80. Um, and then for each of these um, stages, we have message IDDs related to, in this case, seed quality, fertilizer, pesticides, um, and they have an, an so-called offset day, which means that seven days before that stage is reached, uh, this message will actually be sent to that particular uh, farmer. And um, on the right side, you also see a couple of weather events um, where there are certain thresholds um, which are related to, uh, well, uh, like, like I said, weather events. And if that event would trigger, then the farmer would also receive an, an SMS message. And by connecting, let's say, the model output from the predicted phonological stages with the advisories uh, which connected to the phonological stages, they were actually loaded in an, an SMS delivery platform um, where you could, for example, see this kind of uh, information where you see uh, the bitter cord variety, which is called TIF1, um, and where there's an alert type management at a certain BBC states. Um, and then there's a recommendation for that particular um, crop and that particular stage, which can then be sent uh, from the platform. In this case, at first, it was, was still done manually, but this was later uh, automated when the number of farmers actually was growing. And this was actually developed for quite a number of crops and seasons. For example, we had uh, maize, tomato, potato, pumpkins, oak grass, uh, quite a number of, and also uh, for different cropping seasons. Uh, in Bangladesh, they have three seasons. Um, and so for certain seasons, the, 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 let's say the advisories could be slightly different um, than for um, other uh, seasons. So that was also taken into account. And it was actually some of the, um, let's say, promotion material that was developed by Laltier Seeds to actually um, develop their, uh, or promote their uh, advisory system. Now, the latest information I have, because this is already four or five years ago, is that currently um, this particular system is not operational anymore, because what you see often in the end is still, still although from a modeling perspective, it's actually quite simple. Um, it's still too complicated to maintain um, for third parties, and we didn't have a, a maintenance contract on this one. But I actually found out last month um, that the Bangladesh um, government is working on an Agumet portal called BAMIS, uh, where the, exactly those IDs, uh, because the same partners have also been working on this BAMIS portal, are now integrated into this uh, Bangladesh government uh, portal which I thought was a very nice um, result, actually, seeing that some of the knowledge that you transferred in, 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 this, in this project finally ends up in the government portal for, um, for agrometrology. Well, some um, insight or some, uh, let's say, some news about some of the, the, the data products that we've developed uh, over the last few years. I think one of the most important one is the Ag Era 5 which is the um, um, agriculturally modified ERA-5 product, or I, would, I should say agriculturally tailored ERA-5 product. And this is a global product derived from the Eastern WF ERA-5 reanalysis. Uh, it's, uh, there are several steps. Well, one of the things is, for example, that it's bias corrected towards the operational Eastern WF forecasts. So you're going to actually combine ag 5 with the uh, with the Eastern WF forecast, and they should be relatively uh, seamless. The, the, the bias between them should be uh, should be removed for most of the part. It has a resolution of about 10 kilometers. 
we have daily variables from 1979 up till real time with a delay of one week. Um, the original era five free analysis actually gives you hourly val values, but that's for many people in agriculture, that's basically too much. Uh, they want daily values, so daily minimum, maximum temperature, etc. cetera. Uh, so what we did in this ag era five is that we converted era five from hourly or three hourly to daily, uh, taking into account the fact that the definition of a day uh, differs across the globe, of course. Now, what it provides is 22 variables which are relevant for agricultural applications. So temperature, precipitation and precipitation type, global radiation, daily average vapor pressure, wind speed, and also the relative humidity at specific times of the day. So eight, I think eight times during the day, it gives you uh, the relative humidity, which is particularly relevant for uh, modeling plant disease. Now you can find it on the um, Copernicus Climate Data Store. Um, this is the, uh, if you go to the, for example, the DUI that you see on the right uh, bottom side of the screen, you uh, you will find the, uh, you can, we will get here. And by download data, you have either a, well, a form where you can click what you want, or there's also the CDS API that you can use to download this data. Um, there are also some limitations. Um, I wouldn't say that bias collection is perfect. So biases still exist, particularly for precipitation. For example, the, the chart that you see here compares the chirps, I think it's the green one, with Agri-5 in, in orange. And you see that Agri-5 tends to overestimate um, uh, precipitation quite dramatically if you compare it to chirps but this, for this location. Um, Although the product is near real time, we still have an eight day delay. So about uh, the, I think today, which is the 29th, you get the Agar 5 data for the 22nd. Um, it's based on the numerical weather prediction reanalysis, which may fail to resolve local climates. And also there's no easy API yet. Uh, unlike for example, NASA power. Uh, if you go to NASA power and you click a particular point, you can get the whole time series for um, for that particular point, for the variables that you want. That doesn't work yet for the climate data store. You first have to download NetCDF files. That's not so nice. Um, another open data product that I would like to show you something about is the so-called crop productivity indicators that is actually available since um, end of August. Uh, this year on the climate data store. And that is an, also an operational product, um, which provides insight into the productivity of four major crops, soybean, rice, maize, winter, and spring wheat. Uh, it's a global product at uh, um, decadal time steps with a 0 0.1 degree resolution, similar to Ag Air 5. Um, it is available starting in 2000 up till current with a delay of about 10 days on real time. Um, but it's only available for what I call dominant cropping areas. And I'll demonstrate to you why that is. Um, there is an, actually an app available on the climate data store, but I'm not sure whether it still works. And it also was very slow. And it has to do with the way the climate data store actually treats um, this kind of data in as net CDF files. And what we did actually some validation uh, of this product against the FAO-STOT uh, yields at regional level for US, China, and India. Uh, but the manuscript is still pending uh, for review. So I can't provide you with DOI yet. Now, what the product does is actually, um, it takes, it is a hybrid product between a crop model and a satellite input. What you see here is basically for, we have a crop mask for, let's say the major maize growing areas in the world. Um, and what we derive based on the crop mask is the so-called time series of FAPAR. So that's the fraction of absorbed PAR. Um, and if you look at a time series like this, you very clearly see these cropping cycles into um, that data. And for example, here we have another one for soybean in Northeast China and Heilongjiang. And also here you very similar, very clearly see these, these cropping cycles uh, into that product. And what we now do is we combine that with a crop model where we say, okay, we take our Ag Era 5 weather inputs. Um, we take the FAPAR inputs from the, uh, from the satellite time series. 
we know more or less where the cropping cycle starts based, for example, on the SAGE cropping calendars on, or the FAO GIEZ, the Global Agroecological Zonation, and we combine it with a, a light use efficiency uh, crop model. And that light use efficiency crop model basically estimates the amount of intercepted light from the FAPAR inputs and converts that um, into an estimate of growth. And that gives you, for example, these curves that you see here on the right hand side, where you have soybean for a particular area in terms of total biomass, which is the upper one, and the yield, which is the lower one. Now, this is the principle that's been used to generate that product um, for basically the whole globe. Now, this is an example of, for example, wheat total biomass, uh, 20th of June 2022, so quite recent. And you see that, for example, here it runs from about uh, zero to 13 tons per hectare. It's cropping season not entirely over. You see, for example, here in Western Europe, in France, that there's a lot of wheat which is turning yellow. So it's almost, almost 13 tons, or also here in the North China Plain. Uh, for example, there's nothing yet here on, uh, in Australia because, and, and also not Argentina because the cropping cycle has not started there yet. And uh, you can find similar outputs for maize, for soybean, rice. Um, the only fact is that this only works for uh, dominant, let's say, areas with dominant cropping patterns. So you will find that most of Africa is dropping out of this because the FAPAR inputs that we're using are at a resolution of one kilometer, which are insufficient to resolve the mostly smallholder cropping systems that we have in Africa. But that is really a big uh, limitation of the system. Now, <clears throat> some validations that we carried out, for example, this is what we see for um, uh, validation for soybean in the US at the county level. And what you should, it's more or less, if, if, it is, if it is yellow here, we, uh, we have now almost no um, correlation between our indicators and, um, and, and the, the, all the reported yields. And for blue, we get good correlations. And if it is actually red or orange, it is actually uh, getting worse, more or less. And you see that, for example, the right figure here, we have predominant, let's say, yellow to blue which is the total crop biomass, while the left figure we have more red and orange, which is the yield. And that's actually often what we see is that the, the total crop biomass that we're simulating is a better predictor of yield than the simulated yield itself. Now we have similar, you see, for example, that there are some interesting patterns here. Where you see, for example, in, 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 in Missouri here, we have mostly very dark blue uh, counties here, which means that we have very good correlations between our output and the, uh, and, and, these, and the reported yields. And suddenly you cross the border here with Illinois and most of the correlation is, is gone or here with, with Iowa. But these are patterns that we still have to look into to see whether this comes from. Could, for example, be a change in the cropping calendar as described by Sage, which is, um, is not working out well, something like that. Another example that we have, for example, here is uh, this is a time series for uh, wheat in Spain, um, where we compare the FAO statistical yield here in, in, in gray um, with the output, the annual final at the end of season output from the system, uh, which is here in blue. In blue, this is basically the product which is now on the climate data store. And here in orange, we have a slightly improved product. Um, and you see that both products are able actually to follow the interannual variability in the yield actually quite well. And the improved products actually does even a little bit better than the current product. Okay, um, the last one I want to uh, discuss with you is the, uh, the uh, AgroStack initiative. Uh, that was an initiative started to collect and harmonize key agronomy, agronomy observations of crop type, phenology, biomass, yield, and leaf area. It's also um, basically published open data sets. They are screened um, and they are harmonized. Um, at, 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 well, this moment, the available data sets which are in the system are still limited, but it's growing. And the nice thing is also that we have an API in the development that would allow you to actually query the database uh, in a programmatic way. And this is the uh, the uh, Aarstak portal. Um, and we have a also a viewer 
including there where you actually can query the data, which is in the Argostack portal um, and visualize uh, what is in there. Okay, I think this is the last slide. Um, well, some conclusions, I would say that the Python crop simulation environment provides an open mature modeling framework uh, and implements also several Wagner and Klopp models. We have quite a wealth of examples and documentation available. I must say that uh, support is limited, also limited by funding. So if we really want to uh, work on something together, we have to write joint proposals. Nevertheless, I, I answer emails nearly every day by now. Um, so there are really a lot of people I try to support in using the system. And we, I think we have some, well, useful open data products available now, for, such as Agar 5, the Vocal Score Parameter Dataset, Agostak, and the, the, the Crop Productivity Indicators. And I think that finalizes the presentation, so I'd be happy to take any questions. Feel free to also write comments or questions in the chat. Um, I know we have a lot of work that is obviously related to what you're doing, very similar. There's a lot of synergies. I know we have one project specifically um, that's also working in uh, role advisory services. Yeah. For agrometeorological data, as you know. I don't know if Zhangjing, you want to say a few words, or if anyone has comments, questions, please feel free to okay, raise no, your no, hands. No, just no. Go ahead, Zhangjing. Yeah. Uh, thank you a lot for your very, very informative uh, presentation. Actually, I found uh, we have a lot of uh, our life uh, be uh, between our works with uh, working walking again. Yeah. The first one, just as Luna said, uh, I found for the the work you work in Bangladesh for the uh, for the advisory information uh, dissemination, you use uh, SMS. Uh, we actually in FU we have a tool called digital service port port uh, portfolio. Uh, we can use that to disseminate the information to the farmer. Okay, uh, nice. <laughs> later we can talk about how yeah. it is possible to use it. Actually, I have another question. I'm quite interested in uh, the, the last one you talk about, uh, the agro stack. So who is leading this initiative? So it's possible I feel the joint work together with you? Uh, it's it's led by uh, by us by Vito, but it's also connected to the uh, I think the GeoGlam activities okay. and um, there is this uh, activity also for a data collection on the GeoGlam. Uh, what's the name? Great. There's there's also an activity. GCam. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's one. GCam. Yeah, I think okay, it's okay. also there are some connections with GCam as well. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, if you hand in your space platform, you have um, a dedicated channel to host uh, the uh, we call the agriculture essential data science. So quite uh, the idea is quite similar. Maybe ah, you can work okay. together. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Science long, science long is something to uh, to join efforts on. Okay, I found there are question from Peng Yu. Peng Yu, maybe you can ask a question directly to Dr. David. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so my question is about the, the maybe the last part of your, your presentation uh, is about the use of the land use efficiency model uh, for, 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 for the crop simulations. So uh, in that data, I see you use the far part as input for, for the model and to estimate the bell mines in the entire green season. Uh, so uh, maybe what I care about is uh, the first is about how do you get the crop type information uh, at the global level, and what's the what is the special resolution? Well, the crop map, the, the crop mask is based on. Uh, I can send you the, uh, the 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 links. Is based on a product from I think the um, um, the United States um, crop global crop dominance mask or something. Uh, and that's what we use to derive what we call pseudo crop specific masks, because at the one kilometer level, they are never crop specific, of course, but they yes. are pointing at areas with very dominant uh, cropping systems um, for what it's worth. Yeah. So, so a special resolution of that data is still 
per course, uh, such as one kilometer or yes. even lower? Okay. One kilometer. So, one kilometer. So you, you, you have the mode, maybe the mode is far apart uh, also at one kilometer. So you can. Yes. Have the it's mode not mode, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, from the Copernicus uh, side. So it's, it's spot vegetation um, and sentinel. Okay. So for, from your model, I think there, it is potential to have an estimation of the crop calendar, the actual crop calendar from your model, because you have a biomass. Yeah, you could, we, we didn't have time to do it, but you could indeed try to, to basically fine tune the crop calendar based on the FAPAR curves itself. Uh, in certain cases that would work. Um, there are also cases where it's much, much more difficult because the curve FAPA curves are more difficult to interpret. Um, so for the moment, we use the SAGE uh, crop calendars or the crop calendars from the uh, FAO GIEZ uh, product. But yeah, there are, there are certainly options to refine, let's put it that way. Yes. So if we have the immersed data from the most sensing data as another input, and there is a potential to calculate some crop calendar from the model output. Yeah, at the you moment, the, at the moment, the crop calendar is input. Um, yes. So you would have to basically de develop an algorithm to estimate the crop calendar from the FAPAR time series and then use that yes. uh, okay. as an input. Sure, sure, get it. Okay. Uh, and finally, is that do you have any plan to downscale the data side to higher resolution? Not to, at the moment. Um, and that is, has to do with the fact that um, for, let's say for global analysis, it is more important to have a long consistent time series than it is to have high spatial resolution. So that's, yes. that's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, the current uh, uh, indicator product, there has the, the, the crop model has no water balance attached to it. That's yes. because we assume that the water stress is 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 uh, visible in the FAPAR. Yes. Uh, but we did run a test actually with a improved model where we did attach water balance and we see that it improves. So my next step would be improve, make a second uh, version two product which included water balance. Yes. Okay. Uh, no other questions from my okay. side. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions in yeah. the chat. Um, Mahmoud, I don't know, and Henry, if you want to ask to read them, or if Mahmoud, do you want to start and ask your question? Otherwise, Dr. DeWitt, you can easily just read and- I can read, yeah, from, from so Mahmoud. So do these models allow to include different stress test scenarios, for example, weather disasters, flood conflicts, and show how these can impact production and crops? Um, no, these models are not designed to uh, simulate the effect of, uh, like, let's say, weather disasters, food conflicts, because the models basically they simulate for one hectare of crop land and and simulate the biophysical products pro processes that that happen um, at that level. Uh, of course, you could let's say connect them to a geographical information system and see what happens in time. Uh, when there comes a flood which has, for example, d destroys certain areas or, or these kind of things. But the model itself does not have the option to include these kinds of um, effects directly. Thank you. Uh, if there's no follow-up, we'll go over to the next question. Henry, yeah. uh, do you want to say a few words? We have your question, but if you want to introduce yourself and maybe describe the question a bit more because the context. Sure, no, I, um, I mean, it's basically following up on what Zhongxin was saying about the digital search portfolio and uh, about the advisory messages that you uh, explained in Bangladesh, no? Yeah. So even if they are a few years old, um, do, you, do you plan or uh, can you make these these messages available uh, through, for example, APIs or publish them as open content? So if the conditions are met, no, you mentioned seven days before certain uh, condition is met, then these messages get yeah. out, no? 
um, if there are any plans or uh, to make them available as open content. So it would be easier, let's say, to 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 connect to them. Uh, and I, I gave the example of uh, of an initiative from Mercy Corps, uh, where they have this proud open content platform where they publish some open content. And of course, the, the digital search portfolio from, from FAO, where we now also try to make the link uh, and publish them on, uh, on, on CCAN open, um, as open content uh, in the hope, and this is more hope than a reality at the moment, to be able to link them also to the data on the hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform. So yeah. just wondering uh, how, you, how you look at that, over. Um. We could try to do that, but uh, I do have to say that these these advisories they were basically developed by Lothar Seeds, this company, together with Bangladesh Agriculture University. So they are the owners of those advisories, um, and they would have to well uh, allow us to open to publish these as as open content. So um, I could request them whether they. Uh, can do that. Um, the other thing I must say is that often these advisories, they are quite uh, connected to a socioeconomic context. Um, and that you have to take into account that they are not necessarily applicable for a similar club in South Africa or something like that. Um, yeah. But well, we could try. I, I can ask whether that is whether the, the advisories are available, whether they well they are available somewhere, but, but whether they can be published as open as open content. Great. Any more questions or comments? I think this is a great discussion. Uh, we'd like to have more of these more interactive. So anything you guys want to add, comments, anything you want to share about your projects as well, anything you're working on that's open space for just discussion. Sounds like a no. Um, think so. Yeah. Well, I think we had some great questions. Hello, um, Olivia. Olivia. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. I was wondering, well, we are a user of the Agir 5 data, so thank you so much for, uh, I Understood. work uh, in, in the vapor, in the vapor program that monitors um, our water productivity in agriculture and, and publishes data on the FAO portal, including the hand in hand. And, um, yeah, one of the question we have is the um, from yeah our users is if there is any possibility you think in the future to reduce the latency of the Agira Five uh, data uh, because sometimes I've heard that there are commercial products that that are uh, available on a shorter latency and uh, in the, uh, yeah I couldn't figure out exactly how that works. <laughs> the point is that the. Um... The latency is defined by the error five reanalysis itself, and that is seven days. Um, so as long as error five itself doesn't improve the latency, there's no way of improving the latency of ag error five. Um, the only way you could do it is by moving from the error five product to the um, ECMWF aberrational forecast. Um, so basically, you take the the forecast for for, um, for you, you take the forecast from ECMWF for tomorrow and store that as the, 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 the meteorological data for that particular day uh, until it gets overwritten by Agera 5 for that day. Um, and that's where you can bridge the gap for those seven days between uh, Agera 5 and real time. But the, the problem is that the ECMWF forecast uh, is not an open product. So you have to buy it. You have to pay for it. Yeah, that's the yeah. Just to yeah, make it. Uh, but I mean, it, out, it's yeah. Understand whether there is any any interest or and and pressure. And if you think that 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 there is room for for advancing in that direction. Uh, um, no, yeah. It's, it's I would say. Uh, push for it uh, at the Copernicus uh, uh, 
data store uh, of the European Commission. I know, for example, that for the Mars system, uh, from the Joint Research Center for the European Commission, that, that is actually done. Um, so they bridge the gap with the U U uh, ECWF operational forecast. So it's, it's possible that the, the algorithms are there, uh, but it's just a matter of uh, now open data and not. Yeah, thank you. I have another question, Gianluca, over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Luna. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Aller. Very, very interesting uh, presentation, indeed. Um, you mentioned a few times that the global agroecological zoning, so this is for, not, not a question really, but rather a comment. Uh, I am be working, as my background uh, suggests, on, uh, on the agroecological zoning, and uh, we are, uh, developing something similar to what you presented uh, with the uh, same uh, need uh, and idea to open uh, the, the system uh, and to move it in Python. So I perfectly understand the limitations. So we also moving from Fortran to Python uh, with advantages and disadvantages, uh, of course, in terms yeah. of how performance. So this is just for, I mean, for your information of also the, the, the participants that uh, we are uh, soon uh, uh, launching uh, the, 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 an update version of the package uh, at the end of, of November. Uh, so we are very uh, pleased to, to, to invite you to this presentation and also all the other participants. Yeah. Yeah, we do. I think what, uh, what it is uh, very interesting in this domain in uh, the, the ability to try to uh, uh, see how the different crop models perform, so what are the limitations, so what are the, the data needed, because also those are many often constrained on, on developing these crop models in the field. So thanks a lot for this, and I, I'm sure I will uh, continue to be in touch. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> And just a note on that, of course, we'll share all the presentations, the recording of the, of the session and all the contact details so we can really grow the community and the idea is to take this offline after the tech talks and, and see how we can work together and, and learn from each other and potentially, you know, continue to evolve the discussion and spark new discussions. So everything will be shared. We have another question. It's not really a question. No, it's a question, it's a comment, yeah. Yes. Great, so anything else we wanna to discuss today? Anything you wanna add, Dr. DeWitt, to, to close? I think we're running out of time as well as uh, questions. I think we had a very interesting discussion and I think it's clear that um, there's, I think, a lot more work we could do together and we can definitely take this discussion, I think, offline to several different teams and groups here that probably have questions for you that they're gonna reach out individually. Um, yeah, so Zhang Jing, do you want to say a few words maybe to close? Just one word. <laughs> so, I agree two words. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot. Pleasure. It's really informative. Do you know we have MAU between FEO and uh, WR? So I agree we can use that to develop some product. We can work together. So you, uh, there was a question you, you have found that we have, we have a lot of the in common. So we, can, we really can do something together. So this yes. is just a start. Okay. Yeah, would be very nice. Absolutely. Okay. And also, thank you very much, everybody, to join this very interesting <laughs> presentation and discussion. So, we can, uh, if you have further questions, feel free to contact Alad. He's <laughs> very open and uh, happy to work together with us. Okay. Thank you all for joining. Then we close uh, the, this session. Okay. Have a nice day, everybody. Yeah. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Luna, you, I think you received my presentation, isn't it? Yes. So I'll share the presentation, a recording of the session, and um, just more information a bit on how they can contact you, tech talks, and everything that we can, um, we can add to make sure that everyone can keep in touch and continue the conversations. So I'll Great. add everyone in this um, group who joined, but also I think the invite, invitees. There's a few people who were on the list and didn't join. So we'll just Bam, everyone. And um, yeah, and then I think people reach out and we can continue the conversations definitely offline. 
Thank you so much for your time and for the presentation and thanks to everyone for joining. And we look forward to working again together soon. If there's any other events or anything, we'll definitely keep in touch and same with you work. Any new research or projects that you're working on, let us know. We are open to doing more of these talks and presentations and also sharing things from, from our side.